Thank you, Eric. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marvin K. White. I am the Minister of Celebration at Glide Memorial Church, and I am honored to be in community and in conversation with you all tonight. I want to thank you for joining us this evening. And we are here, as you know, to discuss a powerful documentary film, Still I Rise. The film director Sherry Schuster, the film director Sherry Schuster's debut project explores the relationship between racism and sex trafficking with women closest to the problems and to the solutions. Sherry follows the journeys of a national advocate and a survivor leader as they realize and prioritize the interdependence of gender justice work and other movements for social equity. Still I Rise features powerhouse vignettes with Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, Alicia Keys, Janet Mock, Viola Davis, Gabrielle Union, Tarana Burke, Angela Davis, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Janelle Monet. It uplifts the struggles, strengths, and resilience of everyday women engaged in a fight for justice, culture change, and healing. The link to the film was sent to you when you registered for the event. If you have not had a chance to watch it yet, please do. Just know your life will be changed. It is a powerful film. I'm going to now hand it over to Eric Arguello, our advocacy manager for the Center for Social Justice for a land acknowledgement. Good afternoon, everyone. We acknowledge that we are on the unseceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten the responsibilities as their caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. And I will turn it back to Marvin. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to now introduce tonight's panelist. I'll begin with Sherry Schuster. She is an Iranian American documentary filmmaker and seasoned fundraising professional dedicated to advancing intersectional conversations about gender, racism, ableism, and power. An LA native, her commitment to human rights drew her into the world of public policy, development, and storytelling. For over 15 years, she worked with nonprofits and elected officials, including former US Congressman Tom Lantos and the Center for Women and Democracy. From 2008 to 2012, Sherry served as an associate director of Covenant House California, CHC, advocating for homeless systems involved and sex trafficked youth. The extraordinary youth at CHC in Oakland inspired her documentary directorial debut, Still I Rise. Sherry's work has been featured at UC Berkeley, the African American Policy Forum with Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, Parlay House, and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Still I Rise has been supported by the Berkeley Film Foundation, Jamel Perkins, the Harness Foundation, and Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Sherry is alum, alum, uh, alum of UCLA and the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. Our next panelist is Dr. Holly Joshi. Dr. Holly joins Glide as the new director of the Center for Social Justice. She's a Bay Area native and has been a community servant and leader in social justice and systems change work for 20 years. She has worked on issues of racial and gender justice, youth and community development, and criminal justice reform through executive leadership positions with government, nonprofit, and private social impact organizations. She is a nationally recognized expert on gender based violence prevention and intervention and served as the executive director for MISI, a direct service organization providing crisis intervention, long-term supports, and advocacy for trafficked youth. 
Before coming to Glide, she worked as the Director of Racial Justice and System Change at Bright Research Group, a research evaluation strategy and design firm that is owned and operated by women of color. Our third panelist is Sandra Haggerty. Sandra is the Violence Intervention Programs Manager at Glide. During her four years at Glide, she has been committed to addressing barriers that marginalized communities face. Her passion lies in advocating for restorative justice and criminal justice reform to address the harm caused by caused to African Americans by systemic racism and mass incarceration. Sandra provides training and presentations throughout the San Francisco Bay Area on domestic violence and intervention and intervention strategies. Sandra is a graduate of the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project and a certified batterers intervention facilitator. And she works with courts, probation, child protection agencies, and other community-based organizations focused on ending family violence. She has facilitated strength and resilience, women overcoming violence, and mindful meditation groups for women housed at San Francisco County Jail Number Two. Please give a warm welcome to our panelists tonight. You can applaud from even there. Let me see it. There you go. <laughs> Good deal, good deal. So we're gonna jump right in to some questions. Um, and I'd like to start with Sherry. Sherry, I would love for you to tell us about your journey to make this film. What made you decide to pick up a camera, put together a crew and create a film about domestic sex trafficking? Um. Thank you, Marvin, and thank you, Holly and Sandra, for being in community with me um, this evening, and to everybody at Glide who joined us tonight. Um, it's it's an honor to be here. Um, so, what motivated me to pick up a camera and make this film? Yes, um, well, interestingly enough, I grew up in LA, the film capital of the world, and I actually swore to myself when I was younger that I would never be involved with filmmaking because of all of the, you know, uh, racism and representation, the cult of youth, the, the patriarchy and misogyny and sexism represented in most media, including films. Um, so it was kind of ironic that I did decide to pick up a camera like 30 years later. Um, and, and I didn't do it lightly. You know, my background was actually in public policy and doing fundraising for nonprofits. And the last uh, major nonprofit that I worked for before making the film was Covenant House in Oakland. And I was an associate director there for four years. And I had the privilege of working with um, youth, primarily from Oakland, primarily young people between the ages of 18 to 25 many of whom were systems involved, um, had been in foster care, had been in juvenile, in the juvenile carceral system. Um, and, you know, over the course of four years, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with the Covenant House shelter in Oakland, but we, you know, we bought Jerry Brown's old commune and turned it to a shelter and it's 17,000 square feet. And so um, my role there was mostly to, tell the story of Covenant House, to do the communications, to do the fundraising, to work with the board. Um, our, my office was in the shelter itself. So I got to connect with and build re deep relationships with the youth there like day in and day out. Similar to probably to what you've seen at Glide. We were doing Thanksgiving together. We were doing Christmases together, like um, birthdays, you know, and, and ultimately it sort of became like a, an extended family. Um, and I got to, you know, build very meaningful relationships and love on a lot of the youth there um, and, and be loved on and be mentored by a lot of the social workers there and, and people that I got to work with at the organization. Um, what became obvious to me is that, you know, the majority of the youth that we served, about 90 percent were African-American and 
most of the young women and a lot of the young men that came through Covenant House, and, and mind you, the kids could stay there for up to two years. So this wasn't like an in and out, you know, overnight kind of situation. Like we, we were all basically like living together for years at a time. So the depth of the connection and, and relationships, you know, um, was pretty profound. And a lot of the youth that I was working with there had um, been involved uh, in exploitation in one way or another. Like a lot of the young women in particular that we were working with had been exploited and some of the young men had been exploited and some of the young men had been exploiters and some of the young women had been exploiters. And it was a very, you know, um, it was a very steep learning curve because there were times where we had to make decisions about, you know, we would find out maybe that one of the youth there, for example, was exploiting another one of the youth there, mm -hmm. you know? And so what do you do? Do you say, because the philosophy of the organization was based on harm reduction and unconditional love. We never kicked anybody out. At the very most, if, if there was like a really like extreme situation, we might create a behavioral contract, say you can come back in three days, you know, there needs to be a cooling period or whatnot. Um, but, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, situations where you're, you're being forced to make decisions about, okay, is, do we turn somebody out onto the streets knowing that they're going to maybe go back to their pimp, that they're going to be in, like in serious danger, or do we let them stay and continue to potentially exploit another youth? All of this was just like, I just, you know, at some point I stopped and I was like, there's got to be more that I can do. This this whole situation, this whole ecosystem of trauma um, is, uh, it shouldn't exist, you know, and, um, and at the time, you know, there was a lot of, this was, you know, from 2008 to 2012. So there was already a lot of awareness at the time about sex trafficking. And there was a lot of people who wanted to get involved with the issue. You know, it was kind of um, getting a lot of attention in the media and the press and a lot of community organizations were adopting this sort of as their signature issue. Um, and yet I didn't see anything really representing the intersections of race and sex trafficking. Um, and so, yeah, the deeper that I got involved, the more, you know, I thought to myself initially, is this is this specifically like an issue that's disproportionately impacting Black girls and women and femmes in Oakland? And then I started doing the research and I'm like, oh, this is also really disproportionately impacting girls in LA. 92% of the girls who are being arrested for, you know, juvenile prostitution. And I put that in quotes because I don't think there is any such thing as a child prostitute. It's statutory rape and throwing a dollar on top of it doesn't make it um, not statutory rape. Um, and so, yeah, like the more in depth that I researched, you know, it was nationwide, it was like 58% of all juvenile prostitution arrests were arresting arrests of Black girls. And so, you know, 13.5% of the population is African American in the United States. 58% of the arrests of juvenile prostitutions are for black girls. And so this, this disproportionality was everywhere that I looked. Every time I was trying to, okay, well, what about in Seattle? What about in Austin? What about in Chicago? What about in New York? Every city, the, the disproportionality was like three to four to five times. Um, and so when I left Covenant House in 2012, you know, I thought to myself, there's got to be more that I can do, you mm -hmm. know? And, and, when I was a young person, you know, I was also, I also had some of the risk factors, right? I was also systems involved. I had been in juvenile hall. I was a foster kid. Um, I had a lot of, you know, high risk factors. I also was fortunate to have a lot of protective factors, you know. Um, nonetheless, as a young person, I remember thinking to myself, if I'm ever, when I'm older, if I'm ever in a position to do something to help kids like me, I'm going to do that. And so in 2012, when I left Covenant House, I just thought to myself, this, this cannot, I cannot just sit here and not 
and not do more to raise awareness about this issue. And everything else that I'm seeing in terms of these other organizations that are like in other media representations of the anti-trafficking movement was mostly being led in a very colorblind way by white feminists that were not talking about race. They were not talking about the disproportionate impact in African-American communities and why this was, the rates were so much higher for black girls and women. And so, um, so yeah, so uh, in 2013, um, I picked up a camera. I had no experience as a filmmaker. I just had a lot of grit and determination and a lot of fuel in my belly from being at Covenant House for four years and loving on these kids and seeing them come in and out of the in and out of Covenant House, in and out of the system. Um, you know, most kids that came in were coming in with a minimum of PTSD, mm -hmm. you know, and struggling with, you know, additional mental health issues, you know, poverty, lack of access to quality education, you know, and dealing with all of the traumas of, you know, uh, historic oppression and intergenerational poverty. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so despite growing up in LA and thinking, oh, I'm never going to be involved in the film business because that's just, that just seems so superficial and ridiculous to me. Um, I picked up a camera and started filming. I was like, I already knew a lot of people yeah. that were in the work in the anti in the anti trafficking movement from the work that I was doing at Covenant House, and I was like, I'm going to try to approach this and understand it from every angle that I can. And so, the, initially, the first year, I started doing interviews with neuroscientists. I'm like, I want to understand the neuroscience around, you know, what is it, repeated stress and trauma? What kind of effect does that have on developing brains? Because there's so much victim blaming and especially when it's girls of color. Hey, so, Sherry, Sherry yeah. I don't mean to cut you off. I just want to spread it out over the hour and a half. And yes, I, I, sure. want, I want people to absorb, you know how much I love this film and your work. I want everyone to absorb every ounce of, of your story. And I think if you've seen the documentary, you know that it is based in love um, for the subjects and the people um, and the young women and the families and the communities involved. Um, so we're going to, um, and I didn't mean to cut you off, I'm sorry, but I, I want to move on and then come back and then pick up your story again with some other questions that we have created for you. Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank okay. you, Marvin. No, no, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Dr. Holly and bring her into the conversation. You know, Holly, you were featured in the film. Can you tell us how you became involved in this work? And how did you meet Sherry and become a part of the film? Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for spending a Thursday evening with us. We know that you could be doing many other things. So the fact that you're here with us says a whole lot about you. So I'm really appreciative to be in this conversation. As you all can see, Sherry has, she said that she had fuel in her belly in, in 2014. And here we are in 2023, and it's still there. I think there might be more. Um, so Sherry and I have been uh, friends and, and in the work together now for almost 10 years. Uh, but for those of you who watched the film, you know that I was at the Oakland Police Department for 14 years. Mm -hmm. People so often can't picture me in a uniform that I feel I need to be really clear that I was a sworn police officer. I went to the police academy as a youngster in 2001. And after graduating, I was very, very quickly recruited into undercover work. I looked young. I was a woman of color. The police department at that point was 90% male mm. and overwhelmingly white. Um, so obviously I stood out and um, was recruited as a young person into the undercover work very, very quickly. Um, I purposely avoided any undercover work that I thought had to deal with prostitution-related issues. I saw them getting ready to go out on the track and, and on International Boulevard, but I was avoidant for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I was like, I don't want to get involved in what I think they're doing, which is bothering women um, who are, are making hard choices to make money. I, I was like, that's not what I'm interested in doing. It also felt very close 
too close, similar to, to Sherry's conversation about her upbringing. I had a lot of risk factors, a lot of protective factors and family members that had been involved in the sex trade. And so it felt too close to home for me. So I would focus my undercover career really on um, what I thought was, you know, the violent crime impacting Oakland, the, the community that I grew up in. And so I was working on large investigations, for example, people that were smuggling stolen military weapons into the city of Oakland, or people that were bringing very large quantities of methamphetamine into the city of Oakland. That, that kind of stuff is what I was working on. But one day I was actually getting off of a shift and leaving, planning to go home and get some rest. And I was asked specifically to do a vice operation and pose as a working girl undercover because the other woman who was supposed to do it had called in sick. And so there was one female police officer that was going to have to do it by herself, which we know would have been totally unsafe. You need a partner. And so this, this, this sergeant, this older sergeant who'd been there for like 20 years, pulled, I said no at first. He pulled me into a room and it was like a room full of 20 officers who were all waiting to do the operation. And if I would have said no, I would have canceled everyone's plan. So I said yes, just for the day. So, you know, they gave me everything I needed. They gave me the wire that I was wearing. They gave me the clothes. Obviously, I had my gun and my badge, and I went out and I stood on International Boulevard, supposed as a working girl specifically to target exploiters, both pimps, so sellers, and John's buyers. And I was very reluctant, but I went out there and I stood on International, and it was life and career changing. Mm -hmm. So two things happened. The first thing is mm -hmm. I was afraid standing out there. It was not a game on the streets on International Boulevard. And this was obviously, I was a veteran undercover officer at this point and had done a lot of um, fairly high risk work, but the ways in which the track and the street was operating at that time, this was around 2004 now, uh, it was extremely violent um, and very risky. The second thing that happened a few hours into my shift is I looked across the street and I saw young teenage girls standing on the street corner working. And I realized in that moment that as I was playing pretend and I was a full grown adult and a fully trained officer with a badge and a gun and a wire and cops all around on the corners to back me up, that these were little girls and this was their real life and that there was probably no one looking for them. So of course mm -hmm. that experience completely changed the course of my career and my life. Right. And I became absolutely obsessed with understanding what was happening. And so I engaged in all the training. Um, I transferred to the child exploitation unit to work on the investigations full time. I eventually got promoted and ran the unit. Um, from that position, I worked on policy and legislative changes locally uh, and at the state level. And then eventually pivoted out of the police department and into running NISI, which was the community based organization in Oakland that serves survivors. And I met Sherry, though, while I was on my last leg at OPD. I think I met her in 2014, and then I pivoted away the next year. When Sherry called me, she called me on the phone. She told me she was, you know, making a film and doing interviews and asked to come in and conduct an interview about my anti-trafficking work. And at that time, I'd been engaged in the anti-trafficking work for almost a decade. And so I would interfaced with the media relentlessly. As Sherry had said, around 2007, 2008, the work really started picking up steam and people were buzzing to learn more and to get involved in, in the work. So there were so many requests that were coming in consistently from the media. And I had done a ton of interviews, but I had grown very disillusioned with the media and storytellers because I thought that they were missing the point. They weren't seeing the victims and survivors. They weren't interested in interrogating the root causes. Instead, they wanted to focus on the salaciousness of the cops and robbers story. You know, the undercover operations and the busts of the, the exploiters. So I was, Sherry can probably speak to this. I, I probably, you know, had a bit of an attitude <laughs> um, when she called, but I did agree to meet with her. And to my great surprise, she was different. She was deep, she was compassionate, 
She asked probing questions. She challenged me to go deeper. She understood. Um, and I think all of that is apparent and comes through in the film, right? There, my favorite African proverb is, until the lions mm -hmm. have their own historian, the mm -hmm. story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Sherry is a lion's historian, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and she recognizes the power in storytelling and the narrative change work. So, you know, the recognition that those who tell the story influence the defining of the issue mm -hmm. and that the definition influences how solutions are framed, where resources go, who is seen as having knowledge, whose knowledge is seen as expertise. Like all of those things are, are the things that Sherry understands as a storyteller and why our relationship has gone from, you know, uh, an interview in 2014 to colleagues and, and um, her being one of my best friends nine years later. Wow. So yeah, that's the very long and short of it, Marvin. That's, how it evolves. that's amazing. Um, and we're all the beneficiaries of your friendship and your work together. I do wanna say before I ask Sandra a question that if you do have questions, um, why don't you go ahead and put them in the chat? Um, we are hoping to have some time at the end of the conversation and bring your voices into um, this circle as well. So please use the chat um, to write your questions down. Um, I want to ask Sandra a question. Um, hey, Sandra. Hey, Marvin. You don't have to ask me anything. I could listen to these two oh, all night. Oh, 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 no. We got you for an hour and a half. Um, okay. You know, you lead Glide's violence intervention programs and frontline work that directly addresses gender-based violence. I'm curious, what made you decide to commit yourself to these issues? You know, I grew up, I grew up in a family and all the men were violent and I never understood why the women didn't stand up for themselves. Um, and I learned this really early, like five or six. I'm like, there's something the matter with this picture. I didn't have a name for it, but it just didn't seem right. And I realized as I got older, we were raised to just be submissive to the men. And these men were very violent. They perpetrated sexual abuse um, um, among the females. They just did things that I look back, I'm like, wow. So that's always set with me. But I think what pushed me into working in this field, um, 2016, so it's interesting, Holly talked about being on International Boulevard in 2014. So in 2016, um, I saw my cousin on 37th and International. I hadn't seen him for about maybe maybe seven years, and he's a couple of years younger than, actually a generation younger than me at this point. But I saw him and I saw him in some, in some in, I'm gonna call them, they're not women, young girls. And so I went up to him and I said, hey, cuz, what's up? You know, how you been? And so he did the, you know, his things like, oh, I'm doing good, you know, I have these women. And I'm like, what women? Like, you know, and so he goes to tell me. And honestly, you know, he called himself one thing. I said, oh, so you're a pimp now. Very interesting when I really looked at these who he called women, when I really looked at them, stared them in their, in their eyes, I realized these were young girls. These were somebody's children, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's daughters. And so over the course of probably two months before he left and took, um, took them to Vegas, I was able to talk to them, him and them. And I just found it really interesting how he because I'm not going to blame them, how he was able to manipulate them and get them to do things that he wanted them to do. Basically, he was using them to sell sex. They gave him his money. They called him daddy. You know, and so I'm a lot older now from when I was a kid. And I'm like, really? So it sat with me. I came to Glide and I worked with, in the Women's Center, and I worked with victims and survivors of domestic violence. So I heard their stories. And one of the things that I found interesting is that the work, all the work seemed to be put on the woman. It's, it's a woman's issue. 
the women need to do the work. It's the women's fault. It's, it's like victim blaming. And I started digging into programs that work with me and I wanted to see what this was about. And in that course at that time, I realized, I, I, I learned that Glide had a program called Men in Progress, right? A 52 week batteries intervention class. So I got to intern in that program while also working at the jail. And I realized there's a lot of people working with female victims of gender-based violence. I wanted to be a female working with the men. And so that's how I got into the work. And I realized, like my heart was sad, I realized that it's hard loving men who I know perpetrate violence, right? It's, it's just, it's very painful to me. And so my work at Glide is really about helping men change their attitude about women, especially Black women, and also having them unlearn this behavior that they learn. What does it mean to be a man? Like, it means something totally different to them than it does to me. Having them um, reevaluate how they view women. And so, you know, I invite men to learn, relearn, and then to stand with women against gender-based violence. So instead of being part of the problem, they can hopefully become part of the solution. So that's the answer to, to your question, Margaret. Your, your work is groundbreaking, Sandra, um, and breaking so many cycles. Um, and I love that you're bringing an awareness to what, what being a man is and what masculinity is. You know, and these are not self-definitions. These are usually the ones that we inherit, you know, so giving folks space to define for themselves with a new set of ideas about what it is, I think is amazing. Um, Sherry, hey again, you know, um, you know, this film is groundbreaking in that it focuses on black women and girls. Can you tell us about your decision to focus the film at the intersections of race and gender. Thank you, Marvin. Um, sure. Um, I decided to focus the film, or you know, on the intersections of race and gender, um, because I didn't see anything out there when I looked at other films and. <laughs> Um, you know, media representations of trafficking, um, I didn't see anything that reflected what I, what I knew from based on what I had witnessed, um, having, you know, been at Covenant House for four years and really loving on a lot of the kids that were impacted by this issue. I didn't see anything humanizing. I didn't see anything that was coming from a place of compassion and love. I didn't see anything that's, that looked ethical or multidimensional um, that really delved into the complexities or the underlying intergenerational traumas and systemic oppression and lack of access and, and essentially the larger context of when and where and how this was happening in America. Mm. And so, um, you know, I think that I am a big believer in narrative change work. I think that no matter how much legislative work you do or how much policy change work that you do, most of those things are going to be implemented by human beings who are using their own discretion and judgment. And so if people are, you know, when I think about like the representation of Black girls and women in the media, you know, most of it is victim blaming. Most of it is, um, you know, adultifying and hypersexualizing black women and girls. Um, and I think that that type of media represent representation really perpetuates, you know, racist and dehumanizing tropes. Um, and so, when I decided to make a film, like I, you know, I was very cognizant of the fact that. Um, I'm not a black woman. I have not uh, been sexually exploited. That's not part of my own personal history. Um, 
And so I wrestled a lot with like, am I the right person to make this film because of my own positionality? And ultimately, you know, what I came to is that I don't see anybody else doing this. And so I'm not just going to sit back and wait for somebody else to step forward. Like I felt like a sense of moral obligation and conviction to do the, you know, to basically, to make sure that all of the voices in the films were exclusively centering Black women and girls and femmes lived experiences, that I could help facilitate that, that I could be a steward for that. Um, but that, I, you know, if you've seen this, the film, Marvin, there's not one white woman or Black, or there's not white, one white woman or man who's speaking in the film. It, it does exclusively center the voices of uh, Black girls and women and activists and women with lived experience and um, advocates. And so, um, you know, Cornell West says justice is what love looks like in public. And uh, I just wasn't seeing that kind of love for Black women and girls in public. And so um, that's what motivated me to make a film that was really intersectional and that came at it with that particular lens. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Holly another question. Um, you worked as an investigator in Oakland, ran a child exploitation unit, and worked as the executive director of a community-based agency serving youth who had been trafficked. What role did race and gender play in your work? Yeah, thanks, Marvin. Um, I mean, it was central. It was central to my work. When I was an investigator, approximately 80% of the victim survivors I was working with were youth of color, with the vast majority being Black girls. And um, I, I always think, you know, we wouldn't still be here if that weren't the case. You know, we wouldn't still be in what feels like the infancy stages of a movement that I've been involved in for 20 years. And there were people sounding the alarms before I came along. So what I saw, from inside a large government institution was deep, wide racial disparities in our response to victimization, actually in our recognition of victimization. The police department struggled to recognize Black girls as victims, as capable of being victimized. Thus, their experiences, their pain and suffering was invisibilized and instead replaced with a narrative that characterized them as willing participants in criminal acts. Mm. So an example um, was the call out practices at the police department. So when I mean call out, I mean, when someone goes missing, you know, a call out is initiated until you find that missing person. Um, and the call out practices at the police department allowed for a lot of officer discretion. And officer discretion in how policies and, and how the laws are applied is so often where we see disparities based on race show up, right? Um, and we often talk about it with traffic stops or stops on pedestrians, right? Um, this unequal applying of traffic laws, you know, Glide recently, we, we engaged in um, a pretext conver a conversation about pretext stops in that unequal applying of traffic laws in San Francisco, but it was showing up in our response to missing young girls all of the time at the police department. A missing black girl from the flatlands was most often going to trigger a completely different response from the system than a missing white girl from the hills. And we knew that missing and runaway youth are at greatest risk for commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and then, once located, once they were located, the treatment was different. Uh, I remember just consistently having this internal battle in the police department about um, if a 14 year old is missing, I don't care you know, what, what race she is. I, I don't care where she's from. No officer should go home until she's located. Yeah. And that was the consistent battle because it was these ra racialized responses to victimization and the inability to see vulnerability. Um, and that work was, you know, within the context of a carceral system. But of course, 
the carceral system interacts with is influenced by and influences all other aspects of American society. But when we talk about punitive responses, they don't just live within this criminal justice system. You know, they're foundational to our country and particularly our, our country's interaction with black people and black girls are not spared from that. Uh, they're, not, they're not spared from that. Um, Sherry shows a few clips in the film that referenced the Georgetown report on the erasure of black girlhood. And that was a research study that showed how Americans view black girls. Mm -hmm. And they view black girls as very adult-like, less vulnerable, sophisticated, less in need of our collective protection as young as five years old. This is our collective impression of black girls. And so the colorblind nature of the gender-based violence movement historically has been problematic. As Sherry pointed out, yes, gender-based violence impacts everyone. You know, yes, trafficking impacts everyone. It touches people of all colors and socioeconomic status, but it doesn't touch people equally. Mm -hmm. And so I think these conversations and moving from this intersectional perspective that the film encourages us and demands us to do is absolutely necessary if we're going to um, strategize and love our way to a new reality. Just absolutely have to be looking at it and moving from an intersectional lens that considers the overlapping vulnerabilities that are created for Black girls specifically in this country. Wow. Thank you. I love that. Strategi strategize and love our way to a new reality. Um, amazing. Um, Sandra, I'd like to ask you to talk about your reaction to the film and how it is relevant to the issues Glide clients are facing and how do issues of race and gender show up in your work at Glide? I think you're still on mute. I am, thank you. You know, the film was powerful, it was profound and impactful. Um, yeah, it, it made me cry. And those that know me know I don't shed many tears in it, but it, it really made me cry and it made me realize how it's easy not to see African American girls and women. We are considered invisible in many ways. I mean, Sherry talked about it, Holly actually talked about it. So it made me cry. Um, Leah's story, it spoke about strength, resilience, and it really brought to life how racism and oppression are Im embedded um, in the human tra trafficking of, of Black girls. So, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was very impactful um, for me. Um, as far as my work at Glide, ooh, um, so I work with both males and females. And so when it comes to the females, what I find is when working with African-American women, the narrative pretty much the same. Um, most of them talk about a childhood where they were physically or sexually abused. And it's usually by somebody that they know, somebody in their family. They talk about how when, they're, when they were in school, how uh, just a couple of little minor incidents, they were punished, they were either suspended, expelled, sent to this school, you know, um, when that behavior kind of oozed on to the community, they were sent to juvenile, right? And a lot of them will sit and cry about these years, you know, a lot of the women that come are in their 30s and 40s and they start to talk and they, they end up crying, right? And they talk about how they wish that they weren't born Black. And they talk about it in a way, not that they're not proud to be Black, but they see how racism has really impacted their lives. Um, and so that's a lot of the work with the women is, is a lot of trauma, a lot of hurt, a lot of trauma, right? And so for me, you know, the first thing I try to do is empower them and then the work comes. Um, 
With the men, it's different. So working with men of color, especially African-American men, there's a lot of anger. They're angry that they're black. They feel they don't get the respect. They feel that, again, they are overlooked. Um, people don't take them seriously. They talk about systemic racism as far as their jobs and education. Um, you know, the criminal justice system, they understand that they're overrepresented in, 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 in the jails. And so they talk about that. Um, and so that's how the work plays out as far as gender-based violence. The African-American men will usually, in class, they would talk about um, why they take out their anger on their African-American women. And it, it's real interesting, so I'm gonna share this. They say that when they walk out the door, everybody is against them and they have all these obstacles and every single day they feel that they, their power is being taken away. And the only place they can observe, observe their power and control is at home. They, I'm not excusing their behavior, but that's what happens when you grow up in a society that is oppressive, right? You're being oppressed, you're going to oppress somebody else usually. And so, you know, the, 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 the racial, the, I'm sorry, so the racism shows up in both of these groups. It just shows up differently. African-American men, they're angry. They take that anger out on women. It's not okay. Women, they usually, it's turned inward and they usually do some self-harming behavior. A lot of the women their cutters, so they they cut their wrist. Um, it's internalized, um, you know. Um, and I'm sorry, Marvin. I'm just I'm thinking about all this stuff in yeah. class. Um, no. You know, but for me, just to sum it up, you know, gender based violence. It just this film showed how gender based violence continues, how the how racism and oppression of Black women continues today in modern day America, you know, and that's just not okay. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, and hopefully I answered your question. I'm no. kind of all over the place that time. No, it was, it, it, it was perfect, you know, how this, how this intersects with our work at Glide is, and how it shows up because we have to look for it differently. We have to keep looking just because it doesn't look like what it looks like in the film or what it looks like you know, on the street, it is there in the TL on the corner of Taylor and Ellis, and it is showing up. And you have to be there to be able to be able to see it. You know, one of the things that stood out about the film is how racism and being traffic leaves you unrecognizable, and the PTSD from that leads to disassociation. And when you become unrecognizable to yourself, you know, then that allows men to project onto you who you are, you know, and this work of, of restoring selfhood, you know, to women as a part of, you know, the healing journey um, is, was so clear and evident as one of the ways, you know, um, that we, must move this conversation forward. I'd like to ask the group some questions if that's all right. And you can just jump in if you feel so compelled. Um, and the first one is, what is most important for us to know about the issue and or issues? And what's important to know about the women and the girls in this documentary? And I could call on all y'all. I know your names, you know. <laughs> I can I can jump in, <laughs> try to be brief and create space for y'all. Um, I think, you know, there's so many things to, to know, but I'm going to focus on the fact that uh, this issue is a global problem and a domestic crisis. Uh, I think that we need to know that the issue of trafficking in human beings far surpassed arms dealing um, mm. to become the number two most prolific crime and criminal enterprise in the world. 
uh, globally, right? Drug dealing is number one. There's a whole conversation to be had about, you know, what, what we believe about the legalization and, and the war on drugs. But right now, as the laws stand, it's drugs and then people and then gun dealing. Um, and obviously our our understanding and our comprehension and our attention is not matching that, right? Like we're not putting our resources into it in the way that we need to be. Um, I also think what's really important is that we should not conflate the commercial sexual exploitation of children with the adult sex trade. Hmm. You know, um, I think we need to be involved in robust and nuanced conversations about the differences and the sometimes intersections, but we need to be able to hold space for both things to be true. That there is a commercial sex trade, sexual exploitation of children happening in this country, and then there's an adult sex trade happening. And in the past, what I've seen happen is that the sex worker rights movement and the anti-trafficking movement have been in tension. Hmm. Um, and that to me is, is you know, problematic. We need to be able to have very nuanced conversations about these different things. Um, what to know about the women and girls is that they are absolutely brilliant, they're resilient, mm -hmm. and they are worthy of all the things that we hope for all children, all people. And that is our duty to create the beloved community where they can live free. And one of the things that I think is really important for us to remember is, is around this issue of trust. Um, and I always, I, I like to think about reframing trust because in this work, we talk a lot about like, well, I want the girls to trust me. I wanna build relationships of trust with the people that I'm working with as an advocate or as a direct service provider. But we forget to trust them, mm -hmm. you know? And to be in true relationship with people it has to be reciprocal. It can't be that, you know, you need to trust me. It has to be, I trust you too. And I, my time at Missy as the executive director working in a direct service organization that was serving 400 traffic girls a year was a true gift. And it was a, a lesson in me trusting what the girls had to say because they are experts in their lives and they come up with adaptations to systemic oppression all the time. Um, you know, and then what happens is, is that they come up with their adaptations and their own interventions to their oppression mm. and then to, in order to survive. And then we punish them for their survival and we don't even recognize them until they've broken a rule or a law. And then we come along and try to punish them for survival. Um, but what we really need to do is be in relationship and listen to what they say. The Alliance for Girls, the Young Women's Freedom Center, they do an amazing job of, of not only working with young women who are at risk or involved in trafficking, but running research reports relentlessly that center their voices. And you can you know, read their research reports. The girls say poverty is the number one barrier to me being able to fulfill my dreams. You know, and then they and they name what the resources are that they need and that that keep them safe. You know, more understanding, more support and compassion from family members, more direct intervention from community members, more teachers of color and role models, more girl safe spaces, and more mentors and people who are willing to use their power to create access and opportunities for them. So they're resilient, they're brilliant, they're experts in their lives. They come up with adaptations. Um, and I think being in deep relationships with, with girls and women, particularly vulnerable Black women and girls, and really uplifting their voices in everything that we do is what I, I want us to understand. Thank you. Um, Sherry or Sandra, is there anything that we need to know about the women and girls in this documentary? I actually don't know the women and the girls in the documentary, but from my experience working with other women, you know, one of the things that really, I guess, bothered me, and I think Sherry pointed it out earlier, 
is that a lot of when we talk about we talk about women women and we talk about girls a lot of these african american um are girls they're girls so they they start you know they get pulled in at 12 you know uh, 12 13 14 and being a criminal justice major they cannot consent they are not consenting they are forced and coerced and i think it's important i don't care how old a 12 year old looks if she looks like she's 18 and she's 12 she's still 12. Yeah. And and 12, you cannot give consent. You can't sign a contract. You can't give consent for anything. And I think for me, I get really upset. For real. I get really upset when I hear people sexualizing any women, but especially young girls. A lot of this starts in society, though. And some of it just goes way back to slavery times. But it's not okay. So I think there needs to be, like Holly said, there's need to be talk about women, sex trafficking, women who are sex, and then children. And we need to always remember children cannot give consent. Like like Sherry said, there's no such thing as a juvenile prostitute. These are kids. Great. Um, Sherry, do you have anything to say on this? And then I'd like to really um, pivot and open it up to those who are gathered who might have some questions for us. Sure, I mean, I think Holly and Sandra, you know, had so many brilliant insights and reflections. And um, so I only have one quick thing that I'd like to add to that is just that, you know, the majority of girls that are being sexually exploited have a history of sexual abuse. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've, they've, we've, this is something that is addressed in the film and I think has already been addressed in this panel. But, you know, I don't think people realize that like a lot of times because there's a history of sexual abuse and, and often physical and emotional abuse as well. Um, but when a girl is being taught at a very young age that her body is just an object, you know, and, and I think Marvin, what you said was just brilliant and just so um, insightful about the disassociation and the depersonalization that happens when you're being traumatized repeatedly. And so, um, you know, your, your identity can be very easily lost, especially as a, as a young girl. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you add that to the fact that a lot of these girls are systems involved in foster care, et cetera. And, you know, when you have a man coming along who's promising them with some form of false love, you know, I'm, I'm your boyfriend, I'm your daddy, I'm your family. Oh, okay, well, family, like that's the word, you know, that's the hook. And like most young girls, like they're looking for love and validation and acceptance and a sense of belonging. So that's, you know, I think something that's really important to keep top of mind too, when we're talking about how does a girl, you know, get recruited into the commercial sex industry and why does she stay and why doesn't she, you know, all these questions that are ultimately the underlying subtext is victim blaming, victim blaming, victim blaming, that there's a deep, very human and universal desire for love underneath yeah. this. That's amazing. Um, you know, coming out of that, um, Black History Month and being in Women's History Month, you know, thinking a lot about the narrative of enslaved Africans as if they just went along with it, that they just just gave in. Um, I'd like to think that young girls and women have always and will always resist and are fighting and are strategizing. And so maybe we can get to a place where we're not saving people where we're meeting them at the place where they're fighting and joining them there. You know, um, I don't think we have to go that far in to find them. You know, because they are they are fighting this whole time, and so um, I don't know who said that earlier, but it really made me think that we are they're not just sitting there. A lot of girls and women are fighting um, to come back to themselves. Um, can we open it up to the group for some questions? How do y'all feel? Great. Um, and some of the questions. Um, have been answered, but I'll ask them because they're um, 
they're in the chat right now. Um, a question from Michael. Um, he asked, what was a common reason for the people, the young women and girls, and maybe even, you know, what we know about those who were trafficking, to be in their situations? Like, what started them on their journey of leaving home, or specifically about the girls who were being trafficked? What started them on their journey from leaving home, or how did they become people who had to do the things they did for money? Hi, Marvin. I, I, I'd like to say that I, I feel like we've we've kind of answered that, mm -hmm. like the last mm -hmm. question, you know, that was um, yeah. pretty thoroughly uh, addressed. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, usually, you know, a confluence of, of factors that includes, you know, uh, historic oppression, intergenerational poverty, abuse, you know, sexual violence, lack of access and opportunities to alternatives. Um, just like, you know, anybody's life, it's usually very uh, complex when you look closely. Yeah. Um, but those are some, like, definitely some um, some threads that run through a, a lot of um, what leads to this. Thank you, but, Sherry. And I think the term, Sherry, that I learned in the film was that there are victim-rich environments, you know, that there are places um, that produce more cofactors for the possibility of tra trafficking to happen. Um, Elizabeth asked, is there or are there ways we can help with this endangered population as average citizens? Yeah, of course. There's so many, so many ways um, to get involved that I, I definitely want Sherry and, and Sandra to help me out here. But what what I think is important to remember and what the film so eloquently lifts up is that sex trafficking is just a symptom, right? It's the symptom. It, it's not the actual problem. And so it's the symptom of all the isms that we're, we've been talking about. It's, it's the symptom of racism and sexism, oppression and poverty and, and school push out and systems involvement and abuse and all those things. So if you are working on any of those things, you are doing preventative work in this area. I mean, that's, that's, I know that sounds very broad, but I, I mean, that's really what we wanted to get across in the film. And what I've learned over the years is that in order to be impacting and preventing sex trafficking, it does, you don't need to be going to an organization that's specifically doing sex trafficking work. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you're, if you're working with organizations that are doing anti-racism work, you're working with organizations that are really trying to create equity um, and restoration in the Black community, then, then that's the work. And so I say all of that to say, you know, it's really about finding where your passions and skill set lie, because the need is so great that, you know, you can, you can bring money to the table, you can bring grant writing to the table, you can bring volunteering, direct service action to the table. There's just so many ways to get involved. And even just as your, you know, as a voter, your voting power is hugely important. And just really, you know, I hope that we all walk away with like this eye towards interrogating all of these social issues and making sure that the people that we're voting for and the bills um, and legislation that we're supporting are actually community-based, community-focused, informed by the most impacted people, because otherwise they're at risk of, of being very harmful and replicating these cycles that, that Sherry was talking about. And so I know that's a broad answer. If you want to be directly, directly involved in anti-trafficking anti work, then the organization I came from, Missy in Oakland, they're doing great work. The Young Women's Freedom Center in San Francisco is doing great work. Um, but of course, I'm going to give a shout out to Glide because, um, you know, all of our social justice work, it, you know, women and girls of color and women and families of color is our most recent um, issue area of focus. 
And so we're going to be doing a lot of policy and advocacy and community organizing around uh, these issues. So if you're already in touch with Glide, then please be continue to be on the lookout for messages coming from Glide, particularly uh, Marvin in the church and me in the um, Center for Social Justice, because we're going to continue to uplift and find more and more robust ways to get involved in issues that are directly impacting women and girls. But Sherry and, and, and Sandra, please add to what I've said. Yeah. And the question again was, what are the ways that we can help as average citizens um, this endangered population? Go ahead, Sherry, and then I'll go after you. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I, I would just put a, a, um, a quick link in that I put in the chat. Um, if you go to my film website, which is just www.stilliritethefilm.com, there's a page that's called Impact. And it has like, you know, if you want to learn more, there's a section on reports. If you want to learn more specifically about, you know, where to donate your funding or time in terms of um, organizations and campaigns that serve Black survivors. There's a list of organizations there. So there's there's more resources and ways to get involved um, on the film website page, uh, Impact. So go ahead, feel free to peruse. So, um, so what Holly said um, about, you know, finding the skill set, and you don't have to do this or do that. I'm, I agree. However, for me, there's an added part, and this is what I do on my job, is men need to be involved. Men need mm -hmm. to be involved. Men need to, yeah, money's nice. I mean, I know I could use some money in my program, but what I need is I need bodies. I need male bodies to stand up and I need them to protest. I need them to go to rallies. I need them to write their congressmen and women. I need them to be advocate, advocates for women. I need them to be allies. And so for me, it's a matter of, if, if you see something and, it, and you know it's not right, you know, I mean, I teach the men in my program that it starts small. So you need to check your dad and your brother when they're treating your mom and, and your sister um, you know, when you're doing these things that are not okay, right, um, based on gender roles. And then we go to, you need to check your homeboys, so, and you need to let them know it's not okay. And then if you see a woman on the street, I'm not saying jump in there, because even the police don't like to respond to domestic situations or those situations, but if you see something, I mean, Make a call. If you see a woman, you know, um, and she needs help and you're able to provide that help for her, you know, like Holly said, believe what she says, get her to safety, and then everything else can be worked out. But I believe in men being allies in this fight. Because like I said at the beginning, this isn't just a women's issue. This impacts men too. Because if your mother or your sister or your daughter, the women in your life, they're impacted, it's going to impact you as a male and some other things. So that's what I'm about. Men, I need the bodies. I need men to show up um, and to advocate and say it's not okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I love this question. It's for you, Sherry. Um, if we want to let others know about the film, will the link and password we were given still work? If not, how do we share um, this film with everyone to watch? Um, yeah, so the link and the password will still be available for um, the next week. And then beyond that, um, if you'd like to share it with folks or screen it, you can reach out to me. Um, there's an a, a email address on the website at stilliritethefilm.com, um, or you can reach out to me directly, sherryschuster at gmail.com, and um, we can arrange something. Great. So yeah, so for the next week, this particular link and password will work. And then beyond that, feel free to reach out. Great. Very good. Um, Karen asks, are there successful stories of people being able to unlearn behaviors? And that could be for Sandra as well. Let's let's just talk about that as as with the men that you work with. Um is that is, are there success stories? Of course, there's always success stories. 
there's a level of consistent, but we actually, over the course of what, about three years, we're seeing a rise, not just in men completing the program, but men actually getting involved and helping us do the work, like in the community. Um, and that's a success. We, we, we measure success also by when, the, when their POs, um, probation officers, I'm sorry, when their probation officers call us and say, hey, he's doing well, no more incidents of, of violence, any type of violence, that's success. So there are some. We have others that were glide, right? So we meet people where they are. Some complete the program, they do well, and things happen. So they have to come back and get what I call the tuna. And then they come back, do a couple of classes and we send them out because we have an aftercare program. So we never want to leave anyone behind. And we understand that, you know, if, if you've learned all this stuff and you're 30, a year is not going to fix it all, right? You're going to, you learned it in 30 years, you're not going to unlearn it in one year. And so we always encourage the men to come back, keep in contact, stop by, and if they need a tune-up, then, which I call a tune-up, come back to class, um, no judgment. So yes, they're all success stories, absolutely. Great. Yeah, Thanks. I just want to jump in quickly too Please. and, and, and um, lift up what Sandra's saying. So I, some of the women and girls that I met on the streets and in hotel rooms, are running programs and organizations now. Mm -hmm. Like they're amongst us. Some are out as survivors of sex trafficking and very vocal about it and some are not, but they're working in powerful roles in doing transformative work. Um, like Leah said in the film, trafficking and trauma happen at the hands of people um, and, and then the healing happens at the hands of other people and in community. And so that's, what I had the opportunity to learn about and witness uh, at Missy, you know, being on a journey towards healing and restoration with the girls. Um, and so seeing them flourish in, in all of these big roles and, and making big waves is, is really amazing. So yes, there's absolutely success stories. Excellent. Another question for Sherry. Um, any is curious if you will be making any other films and specifically any film related to online and systemic or systematic trafficking and which is worse, um, free trade amongst, free trade of ladies among men via online or dating platform, dating and platforms. Let me do that again. Um, any is curious if you'll be making any other films, specifically films related to online and systematic trafficking, um, and maybe touching on which is worse, um, the free trade of ladies among men via online dating and platforms versus, you know, the street work that we're talking about now. Um, hi, uh, thanks for that question, Marvin. Um, you know, I am still uh, working on getting Still I Rise full distribution. It's been a labor of love. It's been a, a, a long haul and a very worthwhile um, labor of love. Um, so although, yeah, I do plan on making more films. I don't know. I haven't like decided exactly on what the subject matter is going to be, although this whole conversation has been very inspiring and thought provoking. Um, uh, so the answer is yes. In terms of, um, you know, trafficking online, um, that hasn't, I, I haven't focused on, that hasn't been a focus of mine in terms of like thinking about next films because there mm -hmm. are other things I'd like to explore. But I will say that the one thing I do know about um, online trafficking, you know, we're talking a lot about, um, you know, racialized oppression and the disproportionate impacts on black girls and women. And we're, I, I think, you know, Sandra said something really poignant about like, you know, this is not just like domestic abuse. This isn't a woman's issue, you know, because women are victimized. It, it's always assumed that, okay, well, we're the ones that have to do something differently. Um, and uh, so to the point of online trafficking, you know, 85% of the men who are buying 
sex online are white men. So that's something to think about too. And so when we talk about the solutions and everybody's wondering, well, what do we do and how do we help? Like most of you probably know, are friends with colleagues with or related to somebody who is purchasing sex from uh, a minor. Um, so those are conversations that we need to have, we need to be brave about, and we need to like, you know, be open about. Um, because none of this is happening without demand. And mm -hmm. the majority of buyers in this country are white men. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, and we're going to try to get through one or two more questions. There's a question from Rebecca. What would you suggest for an aspiring social worker? Um, what are ways to make changes today with this topic um, and towards women empowerment? What would you suggest for an aspiring social worker? Um, I just wanna say thank you for being an aspiring social worker. Um, and if you're going to focus on trauma therapy, even more thank you and gratitude because one of the biggest issues that we faced in our work at Missy in trying to get young people connected to healing modalities was an absolute lack of trauma therapists mm. in the Bay Area, period, number one, but also those who were wanting, willing, and trained to specifically work with this population. And the waiting lists were incredibly long. I mean, months months, we were often waiting to try and get a girl to her first therapy appointment. Hmm. So I would say that if you're really interested in, in supporting this population, then it's going all in and like becoming an expert in trauma therapy with this particular population and getting as many healing modalities under your belt as possible. Because as we know, um, people heal in so many different ways. And a lot of the girls didn't want to just do straight talk therapy. They wanted other healing modalities and, um, you know, culturally competent and culturally relevant and body aware uh, forms of healing modalities. So I would just say, do your thing. And thank you for, for being an aspiring social worker because it's so needed. Yeah, thank you. I think you answered Michael's question too which was um, as a male planning on going into therapy for children and teens who are victims of abuse, what is something that he should keep in mind when meeting them for the first time, um, mainly about their experiences and how he would approach the topic? You know, um, I don't know if there's anything else to add specifically to men going into this work or if it, what you just said, Dr. Holly, is still, still holds. Oh, I'm gonna add something real quick. Please, that, Sandra. If you don't mind. So I think it's great for men to work with women who have traumatic um, um, experiences. I, working at Glide, have found that it takes a lot more work um, and it's, it's, it's hard. And so you, like Holly said, you, you really, as a male, have to be all in and understand that you, just because of a, a, a woman's experience with men, you know, it just may not be a good fit. Like that's really hard work. I noticed a lot of women, because of all the trauma they had, that men have caused, unfortunately, every man is suspect to them. And so if you're gonna do this work as a male, just know that and you really have to really be patient um, and understanding, um, and don't take shit, excuse my language, Michael, I'm sorry, don't take it personal, but um, a lot of women have a hard time working with men because of trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we're at our time. Um, I want to thank our panelists and filmmaker, and that's Sherry Schuster, Holly Joshi, and Sandra Haggerty, thank you all for, for coming into the space and sharing 
um, this film and your participation in it and you know the work that we're all are doing and how this is all of our work this is all and i just wanted to add quickly as a you know as a public theologian when i heard someone in the film say you know those girls are still made in god's image you know and you have to see god standing on the corner you know you cannot take the sacred out of these young girls image so I want to thank you all for being with us here to, tonight and spending your time with us. Um, I'm going to predict that this film will be screened at Glide one day in the near future. Um, so we'll have to figure that out. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to Eric um, for some announcements. Great. Thank you so much, Marvin. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you for everyone uh, who joined us tonight. Uh, please join us for our next uh, Justice Virtual event to discuss a book by Arthur Ali Winston called The Writers Come Out at Night, Brutality, Corruption, and Cover-Up in Oakland. It's the riveting culmination of over 21 years of fearless reporting that shines the light on efforts to stymie meaningful police report. Uh, the virtual event will be Thursday, April 27, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Please stay tuned for more details. And please sign up to be a justice warrior at glide.org under the Center for Social Justice. Thanks uh, once again to everyone, and we'll wave goodbye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>